Good evening. Yeah, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. We have Erica, Erica Peng with us tonight again because I couldn't record it at the library. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, I let you to please introduce yourself because I may not do justice and you have the floor. Thank you so much, Sohela. Happy to be here and share what I can. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a missing piece in fire safety, and that is education about how our fight, flight, freeze, and survival neurobiology gets in the way of protecting ourselves in fire safety preparation and also evacuation, and then understanding what we can actually do about that. I'm going to reference right. different resources through this talk, and at the very end, I'll add them all to the chat for you, or um, I'll, I'll add a link to a document that has them. So a little bit about me and why I'm here. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I teach a leadership course at uh, UC Berkeley at the Haas School of Business. And my course is based on neuroscience. I synthesize research on the brain, fight, flight, freeze, neurobiology, emotions, behavior, team, collaboration, conflict, leadership, all the things we need in order to accomplish goals together. And I help leaders become aware of how our fight, flight, freeze neurobiology, it leads to misunderstandings, conflict, paralysis at times, and can get in the way of us uh, accomplishing our goals. And this happens in relationships, in families, teams, organizations. It also happens in communities. This is a huge blind spot of our time, uh, how much our reactions and behavior are shaped by our fight, flight, freeze neurobiology. But more than just helping leaders understand what's happening internally, I also teach leaders concrete strategies and practices to help them interrupt this automatic and unconscious fight, flight, freeze uh, reactivity so that they and their teams can continue taking proactive steps to accomplish whatever it is that they're, they're trying to accomplish, especially in high stress conditions that can trigger fight, flight, freeze response. So how does all of this relate to fire safety? Um, part of what I'll be doing is I'll be sharing my own experience as a resident of El Sobrante and as someone who's organizing my neighborhood around Firewise activities uh, to help connect the dots between our fight, flight, freeze uh, and what we're trying to do in terms of our fire mitigation efforts. So um, I'm gonna show you, this is um, down my street. I've lived in El Sobrante for 24 years in a very high fire hazard severity zone on a dead end street next to Kennedy Grove Park. And that's looking towards the eucalyptus trees in the park. This is just at the top of my driveway. And in the other direction, uh, this is also the park. You can see some, some dead and dying trees and all the open space in the back. Behind my house um, and a number of residents, we live along San Pablo Creek. So that's also huge fire risk, all the ladder fuels you see there. And like many of you, fire danger has become a huge stress for me and my neighbors. And I evacuated for the first time, uh, just voluntarily myself, I packed up my car in October, 2019. I think if you, if you remember, that was the year that PG&E turned off um, a lot of power because of the high winds. So I was left with no way of charging my phone, no electricity, I didn't know what to do. So I packed up my car. I left the, I also did evacuation um, the following fall, October, 2020. I think that year there were three fires within 12 miles of me, like Martinez, Danville and um, Oakley. And I wrote a blog post describing what I noticed in my own fight flight freeze reactions, because I'm aware of this stuff, as I was gathering belongings to pack up my car. So I'm going to share that with you all too, so you can get a step-by-step -step, um, 
description of what was actually going on with me. Even though I evacuated those two years, it wasn't until three years later in April, May of last year, 2023, that I learned about what being a firewise home or community meant from Sohela's emails. So that was just last year. But once I started learning about that, um, I, I got going. And in June, just a couple of months later, I organized a core group of neighbors uh, to become a Firewise community. And we invited Mark Evans, who's the chair of the Moraga Arinda Firewise groups to come meet with us and, and help us get started. But even after that, it wasn't until August that I actually began clearing vegetation from my yard within five feet of my house. It, it took me a long time to actually start taking these steps. So I'm gonna share with you some of the barriers and what actually um, catalyzed me and my neighbors into some action. Since then, after we got going in October, um, my neighborhood had the 18 person county chipping crew out and it took them four half days. And I'm now working with Sohela to organize an evacuation drill to test the community warning system in the spring, especially because we're a dead end street. And the Firewise board in my neighborhood, we've been meeting uh, since January to prepare for fire season. A few months ago, I was on one of the West Contra Costa County Fire Safety Council board meeting calls. And understandably, as is common for many of these meetings, most of the focus was on educating people and encouraging behaviors and actions that reduce risk of fire to our homes and our properties. Right, a lot of home hardening, zone zero, zone one, zone two. The problem is, as I was watching this conversation, discussion happen, I know that knowledge and education is not enough to get people to follow through with helpful behaviors and habits. We all know this. We know this from New Year's resolutions, right? We know what we're supposed to do whether it's eat healthier food, exercise more, go to sleep earlier, stop scrolling on our phones, clearing plants and vegetation within five feet of our homes. We, we know what we're supposed to do. So what I'm gonna talk about today is how and why it's a myth that human behavior is rational. There are hidden and invisible barriers deep in our brain that undermine us from following through with our goals. Now, I shared about this on that on that call, the Fire Safety Council call, um, because I, um, I it's just so important because we can educate and educate and educate and spend thousands, millions of dollars, um, but behavior is not rational. So, when I mentioned this on the call. So Hela said, I wasn't quite following you. Could you jump on a call after this and just explain to me what you were saying? I, I think it was important. So we, I, we had a five minute call and I, I just broke it down more clearly. And so Hela exclaimed, finally, this explains the resistance I see in my husband. This is important. And that's why she asked me to give a talk about this because it's, it's relevant to, to so many of us and, and our our efforts. So if you see this image, right, you can either see the, the white heads or the, the black space and the, 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 the goblet in between. So if you look at the white faces, this kind of represents how in the US, this culture trains us to focus on each other and concrete data. We're trained to largely exchange knowledge and information to get results and behaviors that we want. But I teach about, and what I'm gonna talk about tonight is the, the black space in between and the invisible stuff within us, the hidden and invisible factors that actually determine behavior. So I've been teaching this since 2016. This was before the pandemic, but so many are, are really not aware of this and how it functions in day to day life. But you may have heard very recently um, 
Robert Sapolsky came out with his most recent book. He's a neurobiologist at Stanford University. This book is called Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will. He's basically drawing on all this neuroscience to really show that our behavior is not rational. We think it is, but it's not. It's determined by all these other factors. So what is this hidden source of motivation and behavior? We need to reframe education about fire mitigation measures to education about how our fight, flight, freeze neurobiology actually unconsciously gets in the way of following through with what we know we need to do to increase safety or reduce fire risk. And we need this information so we can account for it when we're developing fire safety strategies for residents and communities. So the two areas I'm going to talk about today um, in terms of our motivation and behavior are fire mitigation before a crisis that so many of us are involved with, and then evacuation during the crisis. I'm not going to go that much into it, but that is another element of, of fire safety. What do we do in the middle of the uh, emergency? So in terms of my agenda, I'm going to start with some just general neuroscience, how our fight, flight, freeze shapes our perception, motivation, and behavior. And then lessons from life. How does this actually play out in fire mitigation and actions and behavior? Largely from, from my life as a resident and someone who's on my FireWise board. And then I'm gonna end with recommendations and strategies. How do we account for these barriers from our fight, flight, freeze neurobiology? And I'm gonna cover uh, these different levels an individual, interpersonal, at the neighborhood level, region, state, and the national, because these are all, um, all needed, all necessary, all happening. And it's people <laughs> that are happening within these and all people are affected by fight, flight, freeze. So are you, how's that? Are you following me? Okay. So let's start with a general neurobiology. Just... Our brain is, has been uh, designed, we have evolved to scan for and perceive threats to our survival. And then within microseconds, our brain will, will react and send a chemical message to our body to prepare for harm or danger. Even when there is no evidence of actual danger, that's how we survived, because our brain is anticipating often. Now, there's a, a researcher, David Rock, at the Neural Leadership Institute, and he came up with a framework of five common areas where our brain will uh, react to threat or perceive threat. And his framework is called SCARF, and it stands for, it's an acronym, for these five different arenas. One is status, right? That's when we feel a, a threat to our status. It can happen in a meeting when someone questions us or asks us a question that we don't know the answer to. Certainty, this one makes a lot of sense. The more certain we are of conditions, the more we can plan for survival. The more uncertainty, then that becomes a threat to survival, right? Autonomy, this is similar. The more control we have over a situation, the more we feel we have um, more, some more stability around our, our conditions of survival. Relatedness um, means how safe we feel in a relationship or with people in terms of assuring our survival. And then fairness, we can react to um, unfairness as a threat because that could also be um, relevant to survival. So you think about these areas and how it might be playing out for you. 
when the brain does perceive a threat, immediately all these things happen within the body. Heart rate increases, the liver releases sugar for fuel in case we need to fight or flee. If we feel fear, if the brain believes there's something to fear, the blood will get channeled to our legs so we can run. If we feel anger, the blood gets channeled to our arms in case we need to fight. And all this happens automatically. We have no consciousness is involved in this. Sometimes the reaction is freeze when we're immobilized, right? And we it's important to know what our tendencies are. Is it to fight? Is it to flee? Is it to freeze? You may have heard also appease is another strategy in those moments. Sometimes it's just uh, appeasing um, in a dangerous situation. The problem is as the heart rate approaches 100 beats per minute, cognitive functioning is impaired. That's just how it is because we don't need higher order thinking and fine detail or motor skills in order to run and get the heck out of there. So the energy gets channeled to where we most need it, which is mostly the large muscles. So what happens to performance? We can lose track of things. It can be difficult to track things. This is why two people in a heated moment might recall the events differently or you begin to not be able to even track the words that somebody's saying. Now, when there is a threat response, immediately the brain and the body are just interested in um, protecting and defending this individual. It becomes very self-focused. It's difficult to be open and look out beyond yourself, right? Be creative, be connected, be, empath be empathetic. And then think about what happens emotionally in a threat, an in uncertainty or lack of control. We seek control, we seek comfort, we seek what's familiar. We may try to fix things to regain a sense of control. Another hidden blind spot that David Rock writes about is that change is actually experienced by the brain as pain, somewhat of a threat. Another blind spot is so many people now are in a near constant state of threat response from just daily life coming out of the pandemic, a lot of uncertainty and change in our lives, in the country, in the world, with climate. We may not necessarily be aware of our physiology and being in a threat response, but, um, but we are. And different people have different ways of responding, right? Some may withdraw, some may lash out. We may feel anxiety, irritation, anger, despair. And then imagine being told you need to cut down all your beloved plants within five feet of your house, within 20 feet of your house. In the very moment where you're, we're seeking comfort and familiarity, there's loss, grief, fear, withdrawal, freeze. <laughs> there could be anger, lashing out. There's also the stages of grief and loss. There may be uh, denial or resistance of whatever we perceive as ca causing the, the pain, right? This may be like Sohaila's husband, the resistance to doing these things that we know are good for, that are now you know, protecting the home. Another way that we um, will experience a, 
uh, threat response is something that's called a stereotype or identity threat. And what that means is it's a worry about, will I say or do something that confirms a negative stereotype in other people's perception of me? Now, this is because we're social beings. We care what other people think about us because if we don't fit in, if we're not accepted, we might be rejected and we cannot survive alone. So an example of this um, could be, if you recall the anti-smoking campaigns, there was a phase of the, the campaigns that focused mostly um, about educating people about the health risks of smoking. But the campaigns became more effective when there was a social stigma or a social judgment and shame associated with smoking. Because there, be, there came out of that a pressure to conform to good behavior. So I want to connect some of the dots. There's research done by the Fire Protection Research Foundation. They sent out surveys to 56 counties in California and 26 counties in Oregon. Um, these were counties that had more than 50% wildfire risk to homes and San Francisco was not included. But this, um, this slide shows what were the top motivators for people to engage in fire safety behaviors. So on the left, most to least common motivators and the top motivator was also from being connected to a personal experience with wildfire. The other from, from you know, high motivator to low, just general risk reduction maybe fear, fear of what might happen if I don't do these things. Social responsibility. So here may be something of a stereotype threat. So, you know, the motivation to avoid the shame or judgment for not helping out in a neighborhood or not participating, like the anti-smoking campaigns. Protection of family and property. So this is definitely the, the fight, flight, protect, defend. Finances. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Let's see. Um, it says increase home value. Or maybe this is around homeowners insurance. Laws is the low one of the lowest motivators. And if you think about threat response, laws are, are basically uh, rules that we have to follow. And so in my mind, I was thinking, oh, maybe the laws triggers um, a certainty or autonomy threat response, where we feel we don't have control. We're just being forced to comply. That's not necessarily an effective motivator, maybe because it triggers that threat response. That makes sense. So the research on motivation is missing a perspective from neuroscience, the relationship between neuroscience and behavior. Frank Revolt, he's a former fire chief of Mammoth and now he's the current director of the Wildland Urban Inter Interface Fire Institute at the Cal Poly Institute. I had the pleasure to meet him in December. He came out because a neighbor of mine is a Cal Poly alum and a donor to the Fire Institute. And I was talking to Frank about my work and he agreed that one of the greatest barriers is social emotional and understanding how to change people's behavior. Right? We can do all the research we want in terms of what the strategies need to be around fire, you know, fire mitigation, fire safety. But if we can't get people to, to do these things, that's, that's a challenge. That's a huge barrier.
Another one of the hidden um, neurobiological factors that shapes our motivation is dopamine. So dopamine, it's a chemical messenger that communicates between nerve cells in the brain to the rest of the body. Some of you may know it as the, the feel-good hormone. It's essential to survival because the brain evolved to reward us with a sense of pleasure when we do things that we need to survive. Eat, drink, compete to survive and reproduce. It could be a smile, a hug, an appreciation. These things can release dopamine. And our brain evolved to seek out whatever happened to release the dopamine. Just before the dopamine got released, what was that thing? The brain wants more. The problem is there are a lot of unhealthy behaviors and, and things now that release, that are designed to release dopamine to keep us kind of addicted. Junk food, social media likes, drugs, Netflix, online shopping. But the thing to leverage is dopamine is released when we take small steps towards a bigger goal. Tiny habits. We get a surge of, of pleasure when we complete something that's manageable. And if you, oops. If you think about what happened in the pandemic on TikTok with all the dance challenges, if you think about it through a lens of neurobiology and dopamine, people were learning all these dance steps towards these complex choreographies and they were just getting major dopamine hits of pleasure in the dance and the music, but also the, the pleasure and motivation from, from you know, working up to this big choreography, one day at a time, a few steps at a time. I know this from firsthand experience. So I'm gonna share also a blog post about my experience with dopamine and learning um, some choreographies. It's very powerful. The problem is when we take on a task or goal that's too big, we don't get the dopamine boost. It can trigger overwhelm, paralysis. We can feel discouraged, despair, hopeless. And this might be some of the things that's happening around um, the fire mitigation. It's so big. So connecting the dots. Fire mitigation research and strategies are missing awareness of how our fight, flight, freeze neurobiology drives motivation and behavior. Okay, how are you all doing? Still with me? Okay, so that's the general neurobiology. Oh, we wanna leverage dopamine. How do we break down these huge overwhelming goals into smaller actionable steps? So getting to um, lessons from life. What motivated me and my neighbors into action? It really was uh, a neighborhood fire assessment that uh, fire inspector Chris Giddis uh, came to uh, with Michelle Reinhardt. Uh, there were 26 of us and Chris walked through two of our homes. Mine was one of them. And a number of things happened. He opened our eyes to existing hazards that we didn't even realize were there. all the dead brush under these, you know, the juniper trees. He just pulled it back and we saw all the, we couldn't believe it. He told us how um, it's not, you can't just look at like a shrub or a bush. You have to imagine that the, the flames might be three times as high as it. And that might be hot enough to crack a window or break a window. And then the fire is now in your, in, in the house. He talked about how cracks and crevices, you know, even just wood trim, if there's a little gap or an air gap or crevice, the flames of the fire can just go right up. 
there's a radiation effect, like things stacked up against the house. If there's a little gap, the heat will just bounce back and forth between the the walls or the the items and the objects and increase heat. He gave us very specific actionable priorities that helped us get unstuck. And again, many of us knew these things. We had read them, but there was a there's often a lot of information on websites. It's just, it's so much. And he really just broke it down into zone zero. If you're gonna start somewhere, start within five feet of your house. And then he pointed out just a few home hardening things, the gutter screens, you know, the smaller screens to put on your vents. I don't really have a pic, I, I could show you a picture of my yard, but it's almost half an acre and I would just be overwhelmed. I did not know where to start. But when he said zone zero, I could do that. I just started one bush at a time. This one was really important. He disrupted this false perception belief that many of us were holding that the firefighters would come. And he said that it takes 14 fire personnel to safely deal with one structure. So they, even if they do come, they're gonna be overwhelmed. So that was when we, it became very clear to us like, oh, it's in our hands what we're doing now. He actually said to us, your strategy is what you do now and your to-go bag and an evacuation. And I think that broke through to us. So a number of people that I've talked to now said it was after that talk that they, be, they went home and they started clearing, but not before that. So let me connect the dots. So it's a combination of education and disrupting our blind spots about being saved that was effective for shifting us into agency and action. And it was very hard to start. It took me a number of years after I evacuated. But once I did start, because I had just some clear steps, then I began tapping into my dopamine loop. And now I feel relief and satisfaction, actually, each time I fill up my green bin. <laughs> but before, there was some distress involved in that, and resistance, and confusion, and overwhelm. <laughs> so... Lessons learned, what are some recommendations with the fight, flight, freeze, and the dopamine in mind? So starting at the individual and the interpersonal level. Now I'm thinking about organizing my FireWise group to um, encourage neighbors, to educate and encourage neighbors to get involved. It's so important that there's a clear message that we are here to help. Not here's some more things for you to do in your overwhelming life. And then provide really clear steps to take in the same way that Chris Giddis provided us. So on every flyer, on in every messaging, every email that goes out to have, what are those just key things that the key steps that people can take? The combination of the two being a resource and help and then giving a path and modeling builds trust, but it also um, soothes people's fight, flight, freeze, threat response. We're all worried about our homes. I wanna give some examples now in GOATS, how important it is to talk face-to-face -face with neighbors and, and put flyers in every mailbox and not just rely on email. The free shipping days from the Measure X funds. 
and behind the scenes follow up and coordination. So it's easy to talk about things like the chipping days, fuel reduction, but until I started actually organizing, I didn't realize how much behind the scenes goes into making it successful or not. So the goats. It was last summer, as I started talking to neighbors, we were organizing, applying to be a Firewise group. I just kept hearing everyone talk about the goats. When are the goats going to come back? When are the goats going to come back? We haven't seen the goats in a while. They haven't been here, but they used to be here. I had never seen the goats. <laughs> but I realized quickly that years back, apparently, there would be goats grazing, doing the weed abatement on the, on the park land behind the homes. And it became clear that people had latched onto the goats as something that really kind of would soothe, soothe them and their fears. I'd heard that many people had gone into the park and they made verbal requests to a park employee, but it never amounted to anything. And they did not know what to do. There was no process. They were frustrated. There was uncertainty, a lot of threat response, trying to do something, but feeling powerless not having any idea what the process is. So why bother doing anything myself when there are hundreds of acres here that can cancel out whatever I'm doing in my yard and I have no way of trying to get these goats back. You know, this is just imagining what's going on in people and their minds and, and even me on some level. Why bother doing something? So I shared my concern with Sohela. I asked if I could communicate them to the Park District Assistant Fire Chief Hele at one of the Fire Safety Council meetings and, and Sohela Thankfully, you agreed. So I did in, in um, August. I told him the issues, not just with the park, but in this neighborhood. We're a dead end street, and we also have so much ladder fuel um, along the creek that many homes are next to. And I explained the situation with the goats, and we were just feeling hopeless and frustrated. And Chief Hella emailed me the next morning, and he confirmed that. He, um, the goats would be here in a couple of weeks and that he increased the grazing range by $10,000. So like huge dopamine release for me and for me to be able to tell the neighbors. So the goats had become a symbol of somebody is thinking about us. Someone who can do something is knows, you know, we're on the map somewhere. So weeks later, what I heard in the street was, the goats are back, the goats are back. Did you see the goats? Do you see the goats? They were on the dam, then they moved, they were on the hill. They were here for a few weeks. Now, I don't know what the actual impact of the, the goat grazing was, but it, it, on some level it doesn't matter because it, it calmed people's nervous systems and threat response and it got people like re-motivated. It's not hopeless. It built some trust and confidence in me that we could maybe get some, some help, that we're not alone here. Now, building off of that momentum, we were, we were organizing folks to, to get more involved themselves individually. And I, you know, I've really found that just going door to door, we have 83 homes or so and eight or nine Firewise board members. And we just split up the neighborhood and we each took a cluster of homes and we would go and talk to people. And we distributed flyers multiple times in mailboxes to make sure we got information into people's hands. So the first flyer we put in the mailbox was a message just explaining what Firewise was because we wanted to protect our homes and the neighborhood that we love. That was the message that I crafted. What's at stake to lose versus like an overload of information and lists of things that they need to do. Then I submitted a request for the chipping crew two months after the goats. 
So the second flyer that went into mailboxes was a save the date for the chipping and clear instructions on how to pile the green material for pickup. So it was real. There's a crew, they're coming. Here's what you can do. The other thing that happened is um, I had timed the chipping to be one week after our annual block party on October 1st. So it was the first time at our block party that we had actually a table with Firewise information. So Hala came to our block party. We introduced her to everybody. We had samples of different um, screen for covering vents. Um, we had the home hardening, you know, the zone zero, the defensible space information. The other thing that the, the Firewise board latched onto were the little cards that Chris Giddis had handed out on how to sign up for the community warning system. And they just, they wanted to get these cards so they could just, you know, stick it on their refrigerator. I think the last flyer of the season that we sent out was just some information about the national alert system test that was happening. Do you remember that? I think that was, I can't remember what month that was, but we wanted again to send a message to the neighborhood that here's some information that's gonna be helpful for you. So the chipping event, beyond just chipping, we inadvertently discovered, oh, wow, it, it, it really helped build relationships and collaboration by accident and a sense of community. Even in the weeks before, as we started seeing piles appear on the street, it was really significant. It was the first time the community came together to do something as a neighborhood and to see which neighbors were you know, collecting stuff. You felt that they were doing something for the neighborhood, not just their yard. On the morning of the chipping day, you know, cause the fire, the fire crews had told us at 9 a.m., you stop adding to your pile and we'll be there. You can't keep adding to your piles while we're there. But of course, you know, at like 8.30 in the morning, people are like rushing around, putting more stuff out. But what happened is people who were done started helping other neighbors who were still clearing. Just organically. There was one neighbor, you know, with a whole chainsaw and he was just going around helping people. There's a neighbor who owns a, a Vietnamese restaurant and she lives at the top of a, of a steep hill. And so she asked if the fire crew could actually drive up her driveway to um, chip her material. And she offered to cook lunch, a home cooked lunch for the crew after they finished. So it wasn't even just within our neighborhood. It was a really wonderful, uh, just relationship building with the crew. With the crew. But a couple things I wanted to share about the chipping day because it, it it did take it takes a lot to make it a success. It doesn't just you know just because you have the date set and the crew out there doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be that success. So I wanted to just mention a couple things. After I submitted my request, I actually didn't hear anything for a while, and our block party was coming up, and I needed to set the date, and I didn't I didn't know how to contact anybody. So I contacted Michelle Reinhardt and I said, hey, this is the situation. Do you think you can look into this or follow up for me? And within a day, I heard back from someone to schedule the event. Then I was put in touch with the fire captain for the chipping crew. And I just was asking him, oh, well, you know, how do we do it? What, what happens? And he just sort of told me verbally and I said, well, we're going to need something for the people, for our neighbors to understand how to arrange their piles and everything. So I drafted a flyer and I sent it to him for him to approve. And we sent it out in every, you know, we put it in every mailbox. But this is something that I don't know, is every neighbor going to do, is every neighborhood going to do that? 
So I think even like the county having some clear guidelines or instructions to send out to every neighborhood so they don't have to like come up with this by themselves. Very and then really- no, We're gonna get your messages and I'm gonna share it with neighbors who ask for them. That's great. And just a quick update. We now have a flyer that your, your event was taking place within the first 30 days of me uh, arriving in this position. And I do apologize that that delay occurred, but we now have a flyer. Excellent. So, and, that's and, great. and so that barrier has been removed. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Share it with me too. Sorry for interruption, Erica. I know you only no. have two minutes. Sorry about it. Go ahead. No, no, that's great. Um, and then just, you know, promoting it at the block party and just getting people excited, um, getting it into everyone's, you know, just awareness. Okay, so just connecting some dots, but thank you, Michelle. I'm, I'm glad that it just doesn't have to be, you know, everyone kind of reinventing the wheel. So connecting the dots, focus on ways to provide help as opposed to, you know, more things for people to comply with or have to do. Focus attention on connections. We're in it together, you're not alone. There's generosity and support in the neighborhood. There's abundance. Focus attention on pleasure and the dopamine. The shared love for where we live that could be lost. Fun, the food, the friendships, seeing each other. And it's been pretty important to have a leader who takes initiative and can follow through on things, see the opportunities, connect, build the relationships, reach out, share the concerns. Okay. Right, so here are some neighbors helping each other. These are photos that we put in a newsletter to kind of celebrate and acknowledge. And then this was Jenny who cooked the lunch for the crew afterwards. Okay, so neighborhood, building on the lessons learned. We're doing it again, but now being proactive. So, so Hela just sent an email to Chief Hele for me for this coming season. And he, he responded, I think yesterday. Applying for a grant to get more pole chainsaws so more neighbors can actually remove more fuel. And thinking now about community clearing days, scheduling them in instead of happening by accident, like the morning of the chipping event. And we're talking about doing community walks and mapping out um, walking exit routes and just holding fun community walks with people in the neighborhood to walk along these routes. Again, celebrating the progress, not forgetting that part. Do a neighborhood newsletter, highlighting different uh, neighbors. We're actually doing the firewise mitigation. And then what happened just after the last talk, people really enjoyed being at the library, chatting, asking me questions over tea and cookies. So we're now talking about a community gathering, more social to share lessons learned and best practices. And then funding to keep up the motivation and the momentum. We're also, Sohail is helping me plan an evacuation drill in the spring, which is another thing we can go to the neighbors with. And they perceive that as, as help. It is help. Everyone's concerned. So it's another way to get them involved. Um, my slide's not going. The connections lead to care, lead to feeling a sense of responsibility, wanting to contribute. 
And the shipping event and the evacuation drill, I'm starting to see that it's a way to provide help to build relationships, but also to engage people more like year round, because that's really what it is. It's not just these events every now and then. And that a big barrier is, is funding for some of the home hardening, for removing dead trees. It's a lot. And how to involve new neighbors. That's something we're just coming up against with two new neighbors moving in. And then finally, the region. To step back and instead of thinking about my individual house or my individual neighborhood, to remember we're part of a whole watershed. And Alejandro Onasal from the Resource Conservation District and I, we, we wrote up some recommendations about having more of a regional perspective around the watershed. There's over 200,000 people who get their drinking water from San Pablo Reservoir. It's more than just the people who, who live here. And how do we use data from fire modeling that Chief Dave Winokur in the Moraga Arinda Fire District is using to set regional goals and strategic priorities that different agencies and municipalities can collaborate on? Because that's a challenge, these cross-boundary, cross-agency issues. So I'll show you a slide from the Moraga Arinda. There was a meeting that I was invited to for all the Moraga Arinda Firewise groups. And Chief Winokur was showing this modeling software that you can see the, the fingers of how fire would spread across terrain in different climate conditions. And he uses this data to figure out strategy in terms of how to slow the fire down, what entry points into the community um, are to be focused on. So at the state level, again, just including the neurobiology perspective in research and strategy. So aligning home insurance incentives with fire mitigation measures. And this is work that Frank Freevalt at the Cal Poly Fire Institute is working on. He mentioned in December that fire districts and insurance companies have the same goal of reducing risk. And fire personnel know how to do that. And so he's, he's working with, I guess, at the state level, the insurance industry to try to get aligned around that. It's like very forward thinking work. So the, in the survey, reported motivators for people are insurance requirements and lack of home wildfire insurance. The reported barriers to fire mitigation are that they can't afford certain changes. So at the national level, Again, including this lens of neurobiology in research and developing strategies. So I'm gonna show you some results. This means when a homeowner had at least one incentive, most of them completed two or more home hardening mitigations. It might have been an incentive in terms of a small grant, some kind of assistance. If they didn't receive any incentive, nearly half of them completed zero home hardening mitigations. So I think this makes the case that just some incentive, some financial assistance is goes a long way. <laughs> Now the barriers can't afford certain changes. That was the top barrier. Lack of knowledge, resources, time, confusion, difficulty, property concerns, layout. 
But what I want to point out is many of these things fall under a fight, flight, freeze threat response. So for example, like the lack of ability, lack of time, it's hard to know, is it real lack of ability and time or is that the perception from being overwhelmed or being in freeze and paralysis? Don't think anything can stop a wildfire. Is that sort of that hopelessness and despair from the overwhelm of not having clear steps or you know small actionable uh, goals? Confusion, difficulty, that could be, again, like the what happens when we have cognitive functioning impaired. It's just sort of general overwhelm. So finally, at all levels, the importance of reframing fire mitigation and evacuation to include education about these unconscious threat responses and dopamine and how they can be barriers to what we're trying to accomplish individually in a neighborhood, in a community, in the county. And then what specific steps and strategies can help people regulate their threat response, understand what's actually happening, and then leverage the dopamine loops to stay motivated and inspired. And then I have um, a blog post about my fight, flight, freeze reaction during my own evacuation. So I'll, I'll put in the chat a link to that document with the resources. Hi, Erica. It's in there, but it's higher up in the chat because you mentioned it earlier. <laughs> okay, well, I um, actually, put it in again. Yeah, I actually have a, a whole document that has all of them on it instead oh. of like individual ones. Okay. So there we go. That's in the chat. Sorry, that was a lot. And so, Hala and Marilyn, you got this twice. Very interesting, though. Oh, yeah. And I'm hearing more this time around than I did the first time. I knew it was that kind of talk. Um, and it it's even better. Everyone who's new to it, this is better this time. It's because she's added more information and context. Really yes, helped. I, I absorbed more, too. Thank you very much, Eric. I really appreciate it. This is very important information, and I'm going to share the recording with everyone. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking of even sharing it with our advisory board because it shows how important it is mm -hmm. to expand some resources on motivating people to get things done. And um, I hope at some point Measure X can consider some incentives and you know inciting motivations for people. Um, thank yeah. you again. And I do uh, know in Moraga Arinda, I think they're providing gutter screen. So any resident can just go and get some. Who who pays for that? I know, I think it was through Chief Winokur and it must have been, I don't know, awesome. through budget or funding. I'm not sure how they're paying for it, but that's- uh, we, we asked Measure X for vent uh, screens. We did not receive it, unfortunately, maybe next round. We'll see. Or maybe, I don't know, they're working on it. I don't know. So Maybe even including some of this data to show <laughs> how uh, much of a, how significant it can be to have a, a small incentive even. Yeah, maybe we can do it um, through just our Fire Safe Council. But let's discuss it at the next meeting. Thank you again. And if there are no more questions, we are at the end of the hour. I really appreciate it and try to keep mm -hmm. our meetings to one hour, no more. So thank you again, Erica. Any last words uh, from anyone, including yourself, Erica? Okay. No. I just yeah. want to say it was a great talk. Thanks so much. And I think your recording will be popular. <laughs> yeah, Aww, this time so I am recording. Yes, excellent topic. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Have okay. a good day. Good night. Bye. Bye.